it is always fun to greet each other. Most of the time we don't get to see each other, but once a week, and it's always fun. This it should extend longer sometimes. I want to invite Jeremiah Kinman. Come on up. Read us the scriptures. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitness and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I, my, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In the time, Herod, king of Judea, there the priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and degrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by law according to the custom of priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time of burning incense came, all assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared standing next to him. It's standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you. And many will... Men... Shoot. Um... <laughs> Uh, has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, you are call him John. He will be a joy he, and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of God, for he is never to take wine or other fermented drinks, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of his people of Israel to the Lord their God. And when he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their ch children and the disobedient, wait, and to turn their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of righteous, to make a ready prepared for the Lord. People ready for prepared for the Lord. Throwing it. <laughs> Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm a man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand for presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and unable to speak until the day this happens. Because you do not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had saw a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremiah. Good job. Good job. I appreciate it. You're the man. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, 
that it's so ancient, so old, uh, in such a different time and place, and yet you speak your very heart, your present heart to us through these ancient words. And we ask that you would do that now. In your precious name, Lord, open the scriptures to us. Help us to grasp what you are doing, what you have for us, what you long for us to know, and how you long for us to respond. Open our eyes, Lord, to your good work. Open our hearts to your love. Open our minds to the understanding that you give us. And we give you great praise and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're starting a new series for this Advent, but it's going to go well beyond Advent. It's going to go three weeks after Easter. And in this series, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke. It works great for Christmas because some of the best Christmas stories are in Luke. We'll miss the wise men, of course, the Magi and stuff like that, because that's in Matthew. And we'll, we'll miss Herod getting all upset, because that's in Matthew. But there's some great stories. We get the shepherds and all this stuff as we journey through Advent together. But then beyond it, into January, into this study of Luke. But the theme of it, the title of it, the goal of it, are these two words, pursuing God. As we walk through Luke, we're going to be asking this question, or looking at this central thing in every one of the sermons, pursuing God. But I wonder... How you read this, when it first popped up on the screen, what was your thought, perhaps, you hopefully had a thought of what this sermon series will be about, and what's intriguing is these two little words can be interpreted two completely different ways, can't they? It depends on whether God is the object or the subject. Is it God who is pursuing us? Will this be a study of God's pursuit of us, his searching for us, his looking for us, or a pursuit of our, or a story of our pursuing God? You know, most people see themselves, most in the world, see themselves as open to God, a pursuer of God. But intriguingly, the Bible even says in certain verses, and reiterates over and over in different ways, that we really don't pursue God. And the Bible, from beginning to end, is really a story of God pursuing us. He is the seeking God, the chasing God. He is after us for good. And so this series is not about giving you eight steps to pursue God more passionately or five reasons why you should chase after him and have more of him in your life. We'll bounce around ideas like that to be sure, but really what it's about is passage after passage, we want to look at Jesus in the Gospel of Luke pursuing the lost, chasing after the broken, pursuing people that didn't want him or understand him or who even rejected him, racing to find and enter a relationship with those whom some would feel you should never have a relationship with because of their bad lives, wrong lives, sinful lives. Jesus chases them too. And through this series, we're going to look at all of those. And this morning... Looking, in a sense, at Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Zechariah, we're going to look at this idea, barren. I thought about this as I was reading the passage. It's in there in the passage. The Greek word is stere, which is where we get sterile. Stere means barren. When you think about it, it is a profoundly sad word on multiple levels. Because if you look it up in the dictionary, it actually has many different meanings. And I realize that may be hard to read. But the top one, not producing or incapable of producing children. It can mean unproductive, unfruitful. It can mean without capacity to interest or attract. You could say that person's personality is so barren. It doesn't have the ability to attract anyone. It's not winsome. It's not inviting. Their personality is so dull and barren. It means, it can mean mentally unproductive, dull, or stupid. They have a barren mind. It means not producing results, having an ineffective life. Imagine on a tombstone if it said, this was a barren person. This was a life of barrenness. And it can mean destitute, bereft, lacking. So one might say, he is a tough man. He is 
barren of all tenderness. The word is a sad word, and it denotes nothing positive. And it's the word that's used of Elizabeth in this passage. And it's the word that probably best described her own view of herself. Not just the fact that she couldn't have children. And that was obvious, for whatever reason, scientifically. But for the fact of what that meant. In this world, in the Hebrew worldview, for a woman to have a child, it was expected and a sign of God's favor. And when it didn't happen, it wasn't just a tragedy. It was a sign, a proof, if you will, that this person, Elizabeth in this case, had done something wrong. That she had angered God or violated his commands. And that she was outside of his love and care. So when it says that Elizabeth was barren and when she rejoices later that the Lord has taken away my shame. What she's talking about is not just the inability to have kids. It's the whole message that communicated to her culture and to her own heart. That I am worthless. That my life is barren. And barrenness does not extend to just the womb, it extends from it out to every part of my life that I'm barren, unproductive, worthless. And there's a lot of people who feel that way. You see the passage that Jeremiah read, and it says there at the bottom, they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were very old. Intriguingly, in those days, unlike today, we know that the lack of fertility could come from either side, but in those days, it was entirely the woman's fault. If a child could not be conceived, it was entirely the woman's fault in those days. And you have to wonder what she felt about herself and her value and how God loved her. Did he love her? But you know, I really like her. I really like her. Because you know she was wrestling deep and hard. And it says she was old, so she was wrestling deep and hard for many, many years. When the angel comes to Zechariah, his first words are, don't be afraid. And then he says, your prayers have been answered. So it sounds to me like he and Elizabeth had been praying for this for years and years. And had not seen an answer. Have you ever prayed for something for years and years and years and and it doesn't happen? You yearn for it, you long for it, and, and it doesn't happen, and it's years. And it says they were praying. And I like these two, not only for that, but in spite of the sorrow and the hardship, look what it says in the words just above this. There was a Jewish priest by the name of Zechariah, and he, sent, he was a member of the priestly order of Abijah. And his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. And Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes careful to obey all the Lord's commands and regulations. How Elizabeth saw herself, how Zechariah saw himself, perhaps how the two of them saw each other as a couple, was not how God saw them. Is there a difference in your life of how you view your life, its value, its effectiveness, its fruitfulness? Is there a difference in how you view it and how God views it? There's a real problem with our human race is that we don't see things the way God sees things. We don't re- really, as a, as a race, as people, we don't value what he values. We think different than he, is, he does. His thoughts are not like our thoughts, and nor are ours like his. We're very different in our values, what we're after, what we're chasing, what we want to see, what we want to achieve. And the great work of God, it's really a simple work. The great work of God is to bring us and him on the same page regarding these things. The great work of God is to change our minds, our perspectives, our hearts, our passions, our desires, our interests, to get them to line up with his desires and interests and passions and will. To line them up. And so it's very important that your perception of yourself, who you are, is lined up with who God says you are. That you're giving a self-assessment that's based on his assessment. And then you live forward from that. How do you see yourself in God's eyes? Well, they were very special. And I love the fact that the two of them, in spite of the sorrows and in spite of the apparent or clear silence of God, they never gave up. 
You know, faith, real faith, is faith that endures. Anybody can believe that a young life camp or a youth camp, church camp, retreat, anybody can believe in a Billy Graham crusade when it feels that God is swirling around and he's so real and he's so alive. There are many events that can happen in our lives where you feel God is really, really real and we can believe, but belief is easy in those mountaintops. Where it gets hard is not just when life gets hard, but it's at its hardest, faith is at its hardest over the duration of life. To remain faithful, to take that faith that we believed in, for me when I was a sophomore in high school, and to be faithful at it when I'm 40 and 50, almost 60 in January, and 80 if the Lord wills, to be faithful for each of us, to pass through the years. And Elizabeth and Zechariah, regardless of how hard it was to be barren, to yearn for a child and not have one, to wrestle with all that that meant and implied. In spite of all the sorrows and difficulties, it says that to that day, they were faithful. They did what the Lord said. They trusted his word. They were righteous in the sight of God. What a great thing. Well, the angel appears to Zechariah. It's, you only go in once a year, or, or, or actually once in a lifetime, a priest like this. And I talked to Bruce about this. I said, aren't they going to run out of priests? You need 730 or something a year. Who could come up with that many? But Bruce told me, and I, I realize this is true, that it's a family line that goes all the way back, and there are literally thousands and thousands of thousands of people who are in that line. And you don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have any training. If you were born in the priestly line, you had to do service as a priest at the temple. The Greek or Hebrew word is Kohen. And if you know anyone who has the name Kohen, they're of that priestly line. Kohen means Kohen and priest. And if we had a temple, they would be enlisted for two weeks of service once a year. Now, they would take all those priests that came in, and they would draw lots to see who would get to go into the very holiest of places and burn incense. And if your lot was drawn, if you drew it sometime in your life, and there were priests that went through their entire life never going into that special place. But if you drew the lot, then you only went in once in your entire life, and you would never go again. And the lot came on Zechariah. Written in between all this is Luke's way of trying to say that God is working out something big here. This was not a lot. This wasn't the roll of the dice and it just happened to land on him. God had a big plan. He'd heard Zechariah's prayers and he'd heard and seen their tears. And he had a big plan, but he was waiting for the right time. Because God's thoughts are not only different than ours, God's time is different than ours. And they'd grown old and maybe given up, but he had a plan and it was now time. And he says to them, or says to Zechariah, the angel of the Lord, as he appears right at his side, right beside the altar, right in the middle of this fairly small room, and the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Good start. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. Before the story of Jesus, there's the story of God preparing the way for Jesus, and that includes John the Baptist. In the last book of the Old Testament, there are several verses that say something along the line, and Isaiah says it as well, that in the last days, before God sends his Messiah, before he sends the answer to all the world's needs, he's going to send someone else who will prepare the way, who's going to set it up, who's going to make the rough places smooth, who's going to be person after Elijah's own heart who will proclaim the way of the Lord and prepare people. And so the promise that Zechariah has given is not just that he's going to have a son, but that God is going to do something great in this son. And what is it that God is doing? When a word, he's pursuing us. And the beauty of this in sending John the Baptist and in sending a messenger before the Messiah is that God is trying to make it clear to us that his pursuit of us, he wants it to be understood. It's, it's easy to understand or clear to see. He's sending a helper to make sure we don't miss it. And it's going to be roughly 30 years later that John the Baptist will be preaching and will be incredibly famous. His name is going to be literally known across the Mediterranean world. Paul, in his missionary work, is going to leave 
the, the Philip, uh, Philippians area and, and Jerusalem, and he's going to head far to the west, and there he's going to bump into people who know nothing of Jesus, but they've heard of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was famous, and God set it up to send out a, a messenger who would prepare the way. And in this sending, God is pursuing us. He's pursuing us. God is a pursuing God, and there's not one of you in this room that he's not chasing after. There's not one of you that he longs to have to bring you deeper into a relationship with himself. And we've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, as Romans says. We've all blown it. Sometimes we feel inside that maybe that blowing it, that failure, that sin, will make us barren in God's eyes. That we'll never be able to produce as much as we would like or would hope or that he would want. I remember one time coming to a men's breakfast many years ago, many, many years ago. We had a Wednesday men's breakfast and a group of guys. And, and that Sunday, we had seen an amazing miracle, a healing, a person who had this, this cancer. And the Lord had healed this person. She'd gone into the, the hospital on Tuesday, and I got word that the cancer, the tumor that they'd seen there was gone. And I was so excited about it and came to the men's breakfast. And as we sat around, usually we talked about the Seahawks or the Mariners. We talked about different things like that, and tools and things that guys talk about. But that morning I was so excited. I said, you guys got you to hear what happened. And I told them the story and how a little group of us had prayed for this woman. And it looks like the Lord has removed this tumor. We were so excited. And I remember this one guy saying, and there's a moment of silence in this one guy saying, I cannot, in the depths of all my imagination, ever believe God would use me to do something like that. So how do we perceive ourselves? We recognize that maybe, maybe we're broken, maybe we feel barren, but the truth of the matter is that God is pursuing you. And he pursues you not because you've earned his favor, not because you deserve it, not because you've done enough things, to make him want to turn to you. We saw that in Galatians. He pursues you simply because he loves you. He cherishes you. He chases after you like you would chase after a toddler heading into heavy traffic. He chases after you to pull you from danger, to pull you from things that will end your life. He's the chasing God, and you may feel like you're not worthy of it or that it's so unworthy that he would never work in me. But the truth of the matter is, he's after us all. And the third thing that's intriguing this, as we look at the next passage, it describes this servant, this messenger, this John. And it says this, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before birth. That speaks powerfully to the whole issue of abortion, parenthetically. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, still in the womb, says much. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. And he will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. God is not only pursuing Zechariah and Elizabeth. He's not only pursuing John the Baptist with a plan. He's doing what he always does. He pursues us that we might pursue others. It is such a privilege and gift that God would use us to bring good to other people. God pursues us, each of us, not only that we would know him, know his love, know the freedom of grace and acceptance, but then in discovering that, having been given that, having experienced his grace and love and mercy, and given a whole new life, we get to go out and in his name be a part of his pursuit of this broken and hurting world. So this passage, very of all the things, many things, countless wonderful pictures and ideas and things that are in it this morning, just those three ideas. How do you see yourself? Is the way you see yourself the same as God would see yourself, see you? If you wrote down who you are, what you, how valuable you are, treasured, would there be more negatives or positives? And how would that list differ from what God would say to you? My bet is that many of us, most of us, all of us, have a wrong view of who we are in God's eyes. And we need to line those up. And secondly, it shows that God is a pursuing God, and it raises the question, where do you see God pursuing you in your life? 
Where do you see his hand? What are the signs and symbols that he's after you, that he's calling to you, he's whispering for you to come closer? I have no doubt that there are those signs, those evidences in every one of your lives. And sometimes we miss them because of the noise of the world. It's such a noisy world. We have so much to do and so much busyness, but they're there. Where do you see God at work? I challenge you this week to look. Ask God to show you where he's at work in your life, where he is pursuing you. And with that, the third idea is where is he using you? Where is he calling you? Where does he want you in his name to work with him in pursuing others? Because we're not given this grace just so we feel good or even just so that we become close to God, as good as that is. It's in becoming close to God, we become his ambassadors. We become the bearers of this good news that there is a God who pursues us. He loves us. He sees you very different than you see yourself, and he's after you. And he wants to use you to bring that message to others. Who is stronger in the faith because of your pursuit in God's name of their life? Who are you helping to know that God is pursuing them. All three exist. Who are you in God's eyes? Do you know that God is pursuing you? And who is God using you to pursue in his name? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for how much you love us. And thank you so much that you are a praying, or a pursuing God. And we pray to you, Lord God, that you would use us to go deeper and deeper not only in our walk with you and in the mission of this church, but that we would go deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger, more passionately after people that you love. Help us to pursue them in your name and love them as you love us. In Jesus' great name, amen.